like during the time I was like no fucking way that this dude can eat a whole ass mandarin orange I mean the He's thing talking is about like, a slice I think I feel like you could still do it with a cutie if you had a god throat yeah like, god I, throat. I don't doubt it you'd have to be like the mountain from game of thrones what if I choke and die right here on the podcast yeah. it's gonna be a short episode <laughs> I'll get some views though <laughs> yeah it's, it's all right if one of us dies it, it, hopefully it'll give us some views those aren't mandarin oranges, right? No, they're not. These are yeah. grapefruits, but they're bigger. Yeah, That's okay. why I got them. <laughs> Trying to throw okay. the whole root right now. So to preface, we had a, uh, a, a disgruntlement over yeah. this. Yeah, as we do. What was the origin of this? Falling apart. I don't Who even brought know. this up? I don't know how we got to the topic of like being a throat goat, but... Oh, yeah. Okay, Anthony, that, was the, that was the precursor. You're right. Yeah, I Anthony was them. saying that from what I heard, I was under the assumption... Bruh. That he said <laughs> that he could eat and swallow an entire mandarin orange. And my assumption was that, like, okay, maybe peel it. Look, but like, he eats the whole ass thing bunched all together in the little swoikle. So I grew up in poverty. The only mandarin oranges I know are from the cup, okay? They're the little cups. I mean, no, that's And I ate, I ate the whole slices. That's right? respectable. I wouldn't do it. I like chewing my shit, but you know. You gotta play chubby bunny with them. See how many you can fit in your mouth. And swallow whole. Yeah. All right. Here's one. Oh, you're, bunch. you're gonna choke. Do you get like <laughs> zero enjoyment out of that? Because you're just like swallowing the thing. It's diminishing returns. I feel like I'm a snake. I'm like you're <laughs> swallowing. No one's gonna want to listen to this. <laughs> all right. There's like three, four. A lot. There's a I lot. I don't who at all. Okay. Swallow. Oh okay. no, no. Keep going. Keep I going. Swallow it all. No. I have another cup too. Oh, hell yeah. Fucking, All right, I'll finish. I'll fucking drink this shit. Yeah, okay. That was like a whole fucking grapefruit that I just swallowed. Whole. Whole grapefruit, yeah. I'm the throat goat. You swallowed chunks of wet grapefruit. And? <laughs> <laughs> like a champ. Anybody Ooh. else do that and prove to me that you're a goat. Send champion. us clips on Twitter of you throating a whole <laughs> <laughs> grapefruit. Yeah, eat a cutie, skin and all. Do, <laughs> do this viral YouTube challenge where you shove an entire orange down your throat. <laughs> Sig we'll be like the new Tide Pod like craze. Oh, oh my god! Everyone just starts dying. This is how we get mainstream popular. Yeah, yeah. yeah we just make kids <laughs> kill themselves. You know Not you want to throw up that cutie. <laughs> you could probably do it with kiwis. No way. Kiwis are. Pretty I feel big. like it has to be a small too kiwi. solid. Like it, yeah, they're very orange, solid. Oranges yeah. fall apart. Oranges have like a give to them. Like I, I imagine like you could like, kind of like. Boa constrict well, that how much down. More, <laughs> how much more give does an orange have rather than a kiwi? Oh, much more. Come on. Have you ever tried to have you ever tried to squeeze an orange versus squeezing like a kiwi? Yeah, yeah I feel kiwis like they're the same. so much fun. No, what they're the not the fuck? same. I don't Unless think Unless you you're eating like the most ripe kiwi in the world, there's no way. Have you guys had kiwis? Yeah. Yeah. There's like no they're they're the same consistency on the inside. They're like no fleshy. Way. No, they are not. You dude. cannot say that at all. Well, I, have you guys had the same kiwis I have? <laughs> oh no, I haven't literally eaten From the same one kiwis fruit you've eaten. To another, this <laughs> is how it goes. You can eat a kiwi like an apple. Just straight yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So what like, does that have to do? How is it way you're more comparing different? it to an yeah, apple, not a fucking orange. Yeah, an or apple is so much harder. Then a kiwi, yeah. <laughs> Wait, what are you talking about? And a kiwi is harder than an orange, right? Are we on? No, I would what? say they're the same. I no. mean, if you if you dig your fingernail into a kiwi, you're gonna get the same consistency out of it than like an orange skin. No, Wrong. oranges are like way actually. Oh, you're talking about with the skin on the orange? Yeah, well, I'm not uh, like a pre-peeled orange. Well. Well, yeah, because you peel like, oranges to fucking eat we're them. We're talking about swallowing the entire fruit Yeah, whole. you wouldn't eat the fucking <laughs> rind, dude. Yeah, that's the most like, bitter that's shit. That's what we're talking about, though. <laughs> that's the challenge. You can't take the that's rind the off the fruit for what? the challenge. That's, a fuck. that's setting the bar high. If you want to go yeah, above that's and beyond I feel like it's and eat so, the rind. I feel like it's so easy to peel a cutie and eat it whole. Like, they're not big. To eat it whole? Yeah. You oh, gotta right. prove that then. That's you what, can't make but that's a the bogus challenge. claim like that and not back it up with facts and but logic. That's what, okay, that's what the original argument came to be though, because you that's what Alex interpreted what you said as. Yeah. All right, here's the rules. You get to you get a peeled cutie and a cup of jello. <laughs> Ew. Why, why jello? <laughs> to help it lube it up. <laughs> yeah, dude. You're not allowed to drink water, only jello no, for only No jello. water, no <laughs> water. Jello. Has to be if red drink, jello. If you drink water, you get drowned. Yeah. It's really bad for you. <laughs> yeah, 100% <laughs> of people who've drank in water have died. It's true. Think about it. Welcome to the Novel <laughs> Podcast. I'm, I'm Anthony, I said. I'm Alex. Um, and and this is the Novel Thought Podcast. <laughs>
This that is was, weird. We're only the three of us this yeah, time. We're, we're all stuck in my head today. Yeah, He's, we're we're tripping right now in the Alex's Extended head. universe is not here right now. <laughs> yeah, now we're just back to universe one. After having like three episodes with people on. Yeah. It's like wow. lonely. It felt like we were missing <laughs> another person. Yeah. yeah. Where's Tyler? Where's Tyler? <laughs> we got to get a five man cast. That's going to be impossible. Six man. Yeah. That's going to be so hard. hard. There's going to be like three different conversations going on at once. We, part that's what one. makes it good content <laughs> honestly like let us know if you've listened to other podcasts that have had more members and how annoying it gets I, it's I feel like I enjoy it because I've, yeah, I've have, like, listened to podcasts six, with like six seven people and I feel like it's just a jumbled mess it's hard yeah yeah you'd have to be pretty like uh, pretty stern about the talking times and stuff like hey Shut the fuck up. It's going to sound like an Xbox Live lobby. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Also, I'm pretty sure that like podcasts that do have like five members like the Misfits, they can kind of get away with it because they have like a lot of shared experience because they're all in the same house kind of shit, too. So True. I imagine that makes it easier. You need like a like a you need to be able to be comfortable talking with other people like that because you're going to be talking over each other a lot. You're going to be going yeah. on tangents a lot. And even now, like <laughs> we'll have just the three of us. We'll have times where like someone trails off into a conversation like talking about something and then the other two like are giving side comments to each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it ends up just, I mean, I think it's fine then because yeah. it's like, it, they're quiet and it's, on t- it's like only a, the mic a, can really hear it. You it's know? like a layered conversation, yeah. but you can only get, it's like beyond one person talking. There's yeah. not much you can really do. it also depends on loudness. If we all scream, it's different than if we all just kind of like, we're, we're all just BM all each other. We're a, we're a couple of BMers. We BM. Absolute, what does BM yeah. mean? Bad, bad manners. manners. Bad manners. Okay, you're bad mannering. <laughs> I'm a BMer. We're in the we're in the golden age of podcasts right now. <laughs> is this the golden age? Yeah. This is the golden age of art, though. I don't know if I'd agree about podcasts specifically. Why not podcasts? But art for sure. Wait, well, um, podcasts, were podcasts uh, invented? Like the talk show radio. It's basically it's basically like a substitute for talk show radio. Yeah. Or did you say why were they invented? No, when. Oh, you when? were right. Oh, I have no clue. The twenties. <laughs> the twenties when the radio signal was discovered. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, but I think that art right now we're in the best period for it because we can experience any art previously made and anything that's new. And on top of that, everybody like in the world has access to like creative tools like uh, Fruity Loops and. Ableton and Premiere and After Effects because you could all you could pirate all that shit. Yeah, I was you know what I mean? the it's advent of easy. torrenting. Yeah. And it's like literally anybody can create art now. I think it's just really, really cool. Yeah, that's why you have so much like bedroom artists. Yeah. You have so many yeah, people exactly. who are just I mean, there's a lot of people on Twitter that I follow that are amazing artists. Yeah. And all they do is like just upload pictures that they've made to Twitter. Yeah. Like digital art and just shit. random and shit. And then they yeah. have porn on their Patreon. <laughs> yeah, of course. The the golden age of porn too. <laughs> it is <laughs> true. Honestly, true. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> I think that comes in with access, like at the core of it, the foundational yeah. element, but yeah, also in the specification and diversity of art. Because without that wide range appeal and that accessibility, you're gonna get a whole bunch of stuff that is either similar or like very the same, mm-hmm. which is like it already happens, you know. Yeah. Well, like back in um basically before the internet era, art was essentially just like one big thing that was of a period of time. And while there were like, there was obviously diversification within the time periods, but think about like medieval paintings. They were like all in the same Boring. style. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking lame. I don't want to see this rich dude. Honestly. Dude. Okay. Like I enjoy class- classical music or whatever. Get your foot off my guitar. No, I have my bare foot on <laughs> Zane's guitar right now. It's kind of disrespectful. It's right on his whammy <laughs> bar. I'm BMing him. Your, ton- <laughs> your toenails are painted nicely though. Thank you. Uh, Sydney painted them. Shout out to Sydney. Shout out to Sydney. I love you, bitch. <laughs> no, okay. um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> classical music is boring. Like, it's just kind of boring. You don't like classical music? I like classical music. And it's like pretty much what I play like on the piano. But it's like if I'm going to sit down and listen to something, I want to listen to something that's like probably made within the past like 50 years at least. That um, actually has some fucking modern technology. Do you like like classic rock? Yeah. It's okay. Like it's all it's I've heard it all. Okay. Or I've heard a lot of it. I don't know about you, like, but I have a very specific subset of like classical music that I mm. listen to while playing Blade and Sorcery. Mm. And it is mm. 
pretty sublime. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so I think classical music fits in certain contexts and it's good to listen to in others, but it's just like, I'm not going to sit down and listen to like the fucking Beethoven discography or whatever. I literally you know? do that. You no, gotta, you got to find yeah. some of those contemporary uh, but are, classical wait, artists. Are you listening to them? And like studying, or are you listening to them? I'm listening to them. Oh like when I'm driving God. to work, fucking so boring. <laughs> <laughs> What's boring about it? It's just like you're not. It's it's old ass technique. Okay, that's why. But what, what's the problem with that? Because it's I think it's a good. It's a different enough technique and approach to music than it is nowadays to make it still interesting. Maybe I the, don't know. The perception that I have from it is like. I have scoured the internet for like insane genres of music. So mm -hmm. at this point, there's still a lot that I haven't heard. Obviously, yeah. there's still some insane shit, but I've gone to the extremes enough to where I realize how far music can really be pushed. So it makes me kind of in retrospect, go back to the basic classic rock, yeah. uh, classical music, because there's still a lot there, like yeah, the definitely. intricacies of classical compositions and like the stylings of certain composers and everything yeah. are still really interesting I'm, I'm to me, not even saying, in a modern sense. I'm not saying that like there's like all classical music is bad or all classical music is boring even because there are like a lot of like really cool um like interludes and like movements and stuff like fucking Debussy or whatever his name is. <laughs> Debussy number nine yeah, or something. Degrassi. Shit. Degrassi. <laughs> um and then uh Botch. Claire de Luna is pretty good. Bat yeah King Batch <laughs> yeah, <from Vine. laughs> I love him. He does a lot of really good work in the classical sphere. Yeah, Beef Tobin. Yeah, <laughs> Beef Tobin. Um, but yeah, like, uh, like there are some interesting parts. But I think overall, it's just like I'm either listening to this music to fall asleep or to study to because I don't care about it, and I'm just like listening to it for background noise. You listen to like uh, lo-fi hip hop in yeah. a sense that is other than just studying. Uh, barely. Like I'll listen to it while driving, but I'm listening it to an. I'm listening to it in the same way where it's just yeah. kind of like it's noise and it sounds pleasant. I feel know? like that kind of music is intended to be consumed yeah. passively. Though. Yeah, there are some lo-fi songs where I'm like, this is a banger, you know. It, but like a lot of them are just very much like passive listening. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a fair that's a fair assertion really. to make. I just don't feel like it makes it boring for me. It's just that I enjoy it in a different way. Um, I the the reason why I'm saying it's boring is because it's not interesting. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's just not like uh, it's not really what I seek to listen to. That's fair. Know? That's fair. I think there's a lot of utility for music like that, yeah. especially for like, uh, you know, I use it to with, learn like t techniques, you know? Like yeah. I mean, there's still in, in the terms of learning sense, that's why it's still taught so yeah. prevalently in today's like music theory courses, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of simplistic, uh, simplistic goddamn <laughs> like concepts going on yeah. that are done in a really complicated mm -hmm. way. It's like some chord progression. Chord progressions are an easy thing to understand, but the intricacies of how chord progressions yeah. work and how they sound is like something really interesting to say. Because like, like all that stuff is true and it's cool. But like, I think with the evolution of it, like with jazz, like with, um, what's his face? Uh, Coltrane or whatever the fuck. John Cole. Yeah. I forget what his name is. Um, from Gears. <laughs> yeah, from <laughs> Gears of War. <laughs> He wrote like the, it's like Lydian scales something. Like he wrote like a whole book about like uh, creating like new scales and shit like that. And like for jazz and everything like mm -hmm. that. I, I find that extremely interesting. And like jazz is really interesting because of like the, um, the, the variation of techniques and then also mixing in like other sounds as well from it. Jazz uh -huh. is like a like a cornerstone for experimental music that I think yeah. a lot of people don't really see the practicality of. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure a lot there's a lot of jazz heads out there that yeah. are going like, oh, yeah, I understand, which mm -hmm. is, you know, the case. But most of it comes from the actual music theory concepts. It's not just yeah. like I'm trying whatever was going on. Yeah, they're I'm not making like a new timbre because like it's insane how like people shit talk jazz musicians and say they're just like they're throwing notes out like they're just fucking around. It's like. These are these guys are like studying music theory and like looking at like the you know the fundamentals of like chord progression and they're creating their own scales that actually like resolve themselves and like are really interesting or I'm sorry chords not scales but like they're making like their own chords based off scales that they've made off of like I don't know it's just incredible I think that's really cool yeah but like classical music it's just uh it's done it's over yeah with like inventing the new scales mindset 
it, it's it's so tough because you have to understand like how music actually works together yeah. like that. You have so to know it's a really lot about interesting it, yeah. that you're able to do that. Yeah. I mean, blues scales are really interesting to me too because they have uh I think it's like a they have three notes that are only a semitone apart and it sounds like bad when you're just playing it yeah. those three notes right next to each other because it sounds like you're just going up a chromatic scale mm-hmm. but in the um, in the context of like yeah, another the, chord or whatever it's yeah not, it, it in it the works, context yeah. of the blues scale it works mm-hmm. perfectly well yeah. and you can understand that especially in you know going going back to classic rock when and it like, sounds really cool too. yeah you know. Like Led Zeppelin back in the days, you can hear like all of their music is in blues scales. Really, I didn't know that. Which Fucking what, blues gives them that, boys. Yeah, f- blues head. <laughs> Jazz is essentially just experimental classical music, at least taken to another step. Wasn't it? It's like built off blues too, though, isn't it? Yeah, or, yeah. Or there's blues influences. I think there. It's it's kind of an amalgamation yeah. of a lot of different things yeah. because it, it comes from a certain time period mm-hmm. that was just like. Uh, it was a melting pot of a lot. It was kind of the beginning of this uh, cultural revolution that led to today's time where you were talking about the golden age, because it's like, that was the first genre come out to come out from uh, like an exposure to a lot of different genres. Right. Yeah. And it was, that's like one of America's like cultural. Uh, did we invent jazz? Definitely. Who? Well, at least people in I, America I, I didn't did. know that. It's because it, it was black Americans, you yeah. know, mostly. Um or primarily or whatever, but like I it was, it. it's an American invention. Yeah. You know, I knew it appeared, yeah. uh, during like, you know, after slave mm-hmm. times and everything. And it was like the music that they, it was like blues. They were playing outside of just yeah. random clubs and shit. Yeah. Cause that's the thing. Blues and rock and roll was also made by black people yeah. in America. Well, that's all <laughs> basically all popular music was, uh, started yeah. by shout out, black, shout out people. black people. Yeah. Thanks for all, all the great people. music. All the fucking, there was a, in our, in our, uh, music history class that we took in college there was mm-hmm. a whole section about how there was like whitewashing of rock and roll with, yeah. with elvis and everything and yeah. there was like an entire musician that was just replaced by that other <laughs> yeah. guy i, f- I don't remember fuck? either no, of their I, names i forget too it was a i feel like elvis was one of them <laughs> yeah elvis is probably the biggest one but there was one that they literally just replaced on like live tv like they played the song it was oh a my. cover oh yeah i oh, do no, remember that i forgot i don't remember I either of the forgot, yeah. i think i think it was no i'm not even gonna say it i don't remember yeah. who it was but yeah they used to do that shit we still That's have wild. it now really yeah with hip-hop music what do you well, mean? i think it, with hip-hop music it's a little bit less are you talking about ghost like, writers like, no what just, what i mean ghost writing maybe but i i wouldn't really extend it that far because you know, white people in hip hop music still have a lot to offer mm. like Mac Miller, Eminem, which I, you know, I have opinions on Eminem, but <laughs> you can't deny that he was still like yeah, he's, one of the greats. Yeah. He's made moves. For he's sure. made moves. He's, he's a move maker. I'm not here to like gloat all over white rappers or yeah. whatever, but you know, it's, it's something that is some, it's something really interesting in music because of how it progresses. It originates mm-hmm. from a certain place. And then once it gets popular, you, it's interesting seeing the path that it takes once it hits popularity. Yeah. Because also like how other people kind of like copy it or emulate it mm-hmm. and then like turn it into their own thing. Um, like that one really popular song, the wah, 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 where it samples oh, that one Guns N' Roses song or is it Led Zeppelin? I forget. But it's like they sample like one part of that song and they make it into like a whole new thing or whatever. I think that's really cool. Yeah, sampling, sampling is insane. Yeah, sampling and, interpo- and uh, yeah. interpolation is that's that's something it's that's incredible. really fucking yeah. annoying to deal with nowadays because of how strict copyright laws yeah. are. And it's it's so dumb because you see it all the time in uh, like uh, popular suing cases where mm-hmm. they're like, this song uh, interpolates or like uses the melody from this song, and it's like people are just constantly trying to gauge how much of that song is yeah. like and like what the determined line is before we can say that this was directly yeah. copied and i feel like that's it's stupid it's, it, unless it's like a one-to-one comparison i feel like you can't really say yeah. anything about that. like the olivia rodrigo shit like yeah. how she got sued by avril lavigne like the sound or the songs are very similar for sure mm-hmm. like in terms of like uh rhythmically or uh in their flow or whatever but it's like they're two completely different songs like they are two completely different yeah. songs you know like the idea that you can like copyright a melody or like mm-hmm. you could copyright a chord progression is like insane to me because yeah. you can do so many things with that melody or with that chord progression or with that flow or whatever. You know what I mean? It's really stupid to like, it's like copywriting the tools. 
it's copywriting yeah. like it's like yeah. copyright it's like you're copywriting music theory yeah <laughs> yeah pretty much you're not allowed to use a after c there it has to be something it's else. like you're copywriting mathematic formulas it's like so yeah dumb. yeah <laughs> could you imagine you're writing like a math paper and you aren't allowed yeah, to use like, someone's you proof because they can't copy actually use it. that that would be so fucked that'd be ridiculous test, like, you can't <laughs> yeah. do that that's, yeah, that's, that's copyrighted, copyrighted that's by copyrighted. google but like honestly i think now's the time the perfect time for like art consumption because like anyone can make it if as long as you have like access to the internet which everyone has if they go to the library you like, can even have an ai right. at this point fucking do your art yeah for i know you. like, it's ridiculous that shit is insane the dolly shit that that is so funny to me yeah everyone with the trail cam makes me laugh <laughs> <laughs> the discord moderator trail cam <laughs> that shit fucking killed me homer simpson trail cam. <laughs> i love it though it's it's honestly sick it's awesome that's like you're like we're finally like seeing um some of the really cool things that AI can do. Yeah. I feel like it's there's still been such a, like, emerging technology yeah, exactly. too, though. It's there's, crazy. There's been like a lot of talks like over the past like 10, like five or 10 years, like, oh, AI is going to do this crazy thing and this crazy thing. And it's like the most advanced AI we had is like the <laughs> like, I, like basic ass shit. Like, I don't know. It's like fruit AI. Yeah, fruit AI. <laughs> what exactly. fruit is this? Apple. Yeah. yeah. A- AI uh, to us. And like, that's pretty the, impressive too, to be honest. Yeah, but. yeah absolutely. Uh, AI to us was like flying cars, like fucking yeah, yeah. 80 years ago. AI is cool though. It's, there's, um, oh yeah. Did you guys see the, that language bot or whatever? Language bot. Yeah. They're like, I think it was an open AI thing or something like that, where they were making a, a bot that you could have conversations with. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, some engineer was having a conversation with it and was worried that it was starting to like gain sentience or oh something. Oh my God. <laughs> and, Here we go. <laughs> but like the questions that he asked the bot, it was like, do you feel emotions? And the bot was like, yeah, I feel emotions sometimes. Like, uh, I forget, but it, it was like, it's like asking somebody made like somebody tweeted about it and they made like a really good analogy. It's like making a robot that is designed to swim and then after like after watching it swim for a while you're like well it really it must really love swimming because it's swimming so fast it must be getting like an endorphin rush or something like that huh. like it's you're like thinking about it backwards because like we've created this language bot to be able to have conversations understand us and mm-hmm. like you know actually respond to like what we're saying and call back like old information and stuff like that Mm -hmm. so it's and it's using the knowledge of the entire internet and like you know everyone's public interactions and everything like that so it's like it has a lot of knowledge so like to say like you know are you experiencing emotions it could like read three it could read three different tweets and be able to spit out to you like i'm feeling depressed as shit like i don't want to be shut off by the humans or whatever which they say something like that okay but it's like you know i don't think it's actually sentience i think it's just like kind of what it's the, it's, just, it's, it's what it's programmed to do yeah. basically and it, yeah. but that's the thing with the language bot though it's like it's hard to determine like if it's actually if it were to actually gain sentience because it's like we're kind I of feel, programming it to mimic what we do and yeah. what we do is experience emotion i feel like logic does not equate to sentience no i think it, but the thing is i think it might be able to lead to it because if it's learning logic and learning what emotions go with what, I mean, it's not going to obviously feel these emotions, but it can understand how these emotions are come to be. In a way, it kind of emulates, yeah. But does that mean that it's gained sentience? Just I don't know. Because it under- Cause like that's yeah. that's what you would have to define <laughs> as, as like a, that's like a scientific thing that we don't even really yeah. know how to define yeah. An in the AI past 18 weeks cannot be <laughs> <avoided>. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, yeah, it's like a philosophical question about like consciousness and everything. That's really tough. It's like, how far do you go in something that is, you know, I mean, there's a whole uh, field of study right now about like whether or not viruses are sentient because they have a directive and they have like an ability to, uh, well, they have like a need to reproduce Mm -hmm. and like do something, which is an effect as host. And that's something that um, like animals do. It's like the the desire to reproduce or whatever. But it's like there, there's no evidence for them like thinking or like th- just having any sort of emotion like this is what I need to do or anything yeah, right. like that. So at that point, it's like, what do you I mean, are plants sentient? So is then our definition, if it can go beyond its directive, then it is sentient. Like the AI model? Yeah. Because I, I guess humans go beyond their directive, yeah. right? Because like we, you know, 
uh, I guess our our biological directive is to reproduce before we die or whatever. But humans don't really care about that necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, like we have a society and we have like thoughts and we have other things. And it's kind of like, um, like animals have shown like, uh, the, uh, some animals have shown the ability to display like altruism, you know, which I think shows some level of sentience where it's like, they're, you know, being altruistic is not necessarily the best thing for the animal in that situation, but the animal has the wherewithal to determine, like, it would be good for me and this other animal if I did this thing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I think, that's, really I think that's some level of sentience. Yeah. There was a, uh, there was a video that I watched a while ago that was talking about how smart crows are and like how they yeah, can decide. Super, they can like use tools. Kid. Yeah. You, the, the, they, uh, the scientists gave them like one of those block puzzles where it's like the, uh, mm-hmm. the circle goes in the circle hole, cube goes in the cube hole, like the fucking rhombus yeah. cylinder, whatever the fuck, um, the set of different tools. They got could, wrinkly brains. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're wrinkled <laughs> as fuck. They, they also did something that was really clever, um, which I was really surprised at. They had like a, they showed like the bird, like a three sets of tool or like seven sets of tools. And like they all opened like a different box and like the bird could see which hole had the like which shape in it for Mm -hmm. which key. And it would give it a treat or like a a piece of food or whatever once it did it. And it was able to leave the room, remember what uh, shape went to the Mm -hmm. keyhole that would give it food and then it brought it back. But it all I think there was also another test where it like used a different block to get the other block Mm -hmm. to then get the food. So it was like double layered. Interesting. And That's I was really like, cool. damn. It's so weird. I don't know. Sentience is such a weird thing but to think about. But in that scenario, that crow is still following its directive. That's of, true. You know, it's just like, I want food. It's doing the thing to find the food. Yeah. Well, yeah. like the thing inherently about well, AI guess- technology is like, we're training it to go beyond its directive. Yeah. Because we're training it to see like, well, what the fruit AI thing mm-hmm. is like, we're, we're oh, treating yeah, it for these like kinds food. of fruit. But realistically, you're not going to train it on every single type of fruit out there. So it's being trained to do this so it can uh, capture all cases, including like the edge cases in case there's like a fucking like a rambutan or star fruit, <laughs> something rarer. Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh, yeah, I know what this is based on the image and like the pixels, um, everything, how it works code wise. Yeah, like being able to recall information or whatever. Mm-hmm. I think isn't that like a big reason why humans were able to evolve so quickly is like our ability to recall information and, and like abstract yeah. it and stuff like, like that. Like memory is a huge uh limiting factor in animals yeah, imagine because, being a goldfish yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i mean in machines that memory issue can be like <laughs> it's like permanent <laughs> yeah there, there are subsidized. I, there's like there's no worry about the memory issue i think yeah with com- yeah because you can just get it yeah although yeah, it's yeah, more volatile it's more is it i feel like brains are a little bit more volatile because like we don't store thing like we don't store memories like files in a hard drive you know like we, well, yeah that's true we, like the only way you could like recall, like you could forget things completely. And the only way it's recalled to you is by having like another experience that's similar or like a, a weird smell or you hear mm-hmm. something, you know, like brains work very, very I, differently than computers. I think brains have the availability of more information, but with less clarity, whereas machines have more clarity, but overall less information. That, that's probably a Maybe. good distinction of it. What I was thinking originally was like, if you destroy a computer, you're not going to have like the... Uh, you're going to lose all that memory. Oh, yeah. So, But if you do the same thing with a human, if you destroy (laughs) its brain, it's not going to remember anything. There is like, uh, I'm pretty sure people have found like that um, some AI that they have developed have been able to like put themselves on the like other servers and make themselves redundant. So like, it's like really hard to delete them. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's an idea with viruses in general, like computer viruses. They can like reproduce themselves. You Mm -hmm. know, they're like single celled, Conscious organisms. That's what they are. Fucking Inside weird. of a computer. Yeah. Well, multi-celled. Single cell. <laughs> <laughs> its brain is one cell. <laughs> I don't know. Technology is something that we're kind of in the golden age of. Yeah, oh, definitely. yeah, absolutely. We're but I, of, I, I mean, I, you could probably say that about any time period. To yeah, be they're going to call this like the fucking stone age. There have been yeah. 200 years. In the past, like from like the 90s to now, like the technology that has changed is insane. It's oh, actually yeah, incredible. Absolutely. It's like, been exponential going growth. Going from dial up to like fucking like Giga Blast or whatever the fuck. Like, holy <laughs> shit. I used but to, like, and that was only in like 20 years. It might be, yeah, it might be exponential growth now, but yeah, will I, it continue I was gonna to say, be I'm, that? I'm pretty yeah. sure that, you know, we, I used to actually, I used to think that we would hit like a plateau soon, but I feel like that plateau is only within like, uh, 
like all the all the all the research is now going into these hyper specific things. Like we have a lot of research going into, you know, uh Elon with his his dumb rocket idea and like the the hyperloop <laughs> and then you have like this AI advance it's just we're seeing a lot of progress in these very niche areas now and it's yeah. like we haven't necessarily plateaued but our interests are now very specific mm-hmm. well the thing is though is that like the interest in AI might be niche but the application of AI is pretty expansive absolutely yeah you know? Just pretty interesting. And so we're kind of just waiting on those fronts to finish up and then everyone yeah. will benefit by extension, hopefully. I need to bring something up that <laughs> I can't move past. I physically can't. Zane, your socks are on inside out. I'm right going to leave now. them on. I'm going to leave them on you inside freak. out. You freak. You were a freak for that. You were no. touching my guitar. Gets two more days out of those <laughs> socks. <laughs> Yeah, when I flip them inside out. <laughs> yeah. You were touching my guitar with your feet. I don't want to hear yeah, it. Yeah, I got fuzz on my feet now. Yeah, from my guitar. I like to keep it fuzzy. <laughs> you got a fuzzy guitar? Yeah. That's pretty cool. I uh, Something I wanted to bring up with your uh, explanation of like the golden era of like art and stuff. Um, I became very interested. Well, like starting playing guitar, I was always pretty interested in like extended range guitars. Yeah. But more so recently, I like when I first, I the first guitar that I bought What's was an extended this, range uh, guitar. Eight string. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> more than five strings more than six six okay well like something that i heard of someone talking about recently that really opened my eyes to it was like a six string guitar is a six string guitar everyone knows it and like a seven string guitar is like a true extended range where you just have that lower note but like eight nine ten string guitars are like a different instrument yeah and it really opened my eyes to the vastness of it because the way that you know 27 strings. <laughs> you start playing like the zither and stuff. And well, isn't all the there strings. like, there's guitars with like two handles or whatever, like two different. That's frets. like a combo guitar. Oh, but okay. that's, that's the thing is like back when guitar, like classical, classical rock, mm-hmm. when that was like a huge thing, everyone had like some special crazy yeah, guitar. Some nutty guitar. There was like flying V's, flying reverse V's. There was like double neck bass and guitar riffs. Mm-hmm. There was one dude that I saw that had like a quad neck guitar. Whoa. It was like a star fun. shape. And I was like, this is just bonkers. So then like <laughs> people started adding more strings to it, which I'm surprised didn't really happen until like later on mm-hmm. in uh, Rock's lifetime. People really started to see the application of them because it was more so uh, like with specifically metal music in mind. It's like people play the fuck out of those yeah. low strings, but they also have the chord capabilities and like the leads that they do. Um, so it has like the regular guitar aspect to it, but the the rhythm style that they play is completely different than mm-hmm. something you can do on a regular six string guitar. That's interesting. So I ended up buying a nine string. <laughs> <laughs> so I was I was really fucking because looking into it, I was like, I want to get an, another eight string just because it's a lot more technological advances with the eight string, mm-hmm. especially with multi scaling, mm. which is like because of the two lower notes being so low they're not going to have the same kind of uh, intonation as like the higher six strings. Mm. And that's like their ability to play the the note that they're playing. Okay. So on the lowest string, if I played the 12th octave, I think the lowest string on that right now is like a, a D right now. I tuned it pretty low. Um, so I'm just using D as an example. So if you tune, if you play the D on the uh, 12th fret, the octave up, and you play a synth D on the same octave range, mm-hmm. it's going to be essentially like a whole tone or a semitone off oh, really? because of the way that the vibrations or like the way the frequencies are actually being played on the guitar. Interesting. Okay. So multi-scaling is like you take the frets of the guitar and you slant them a little bit. So mm-hmm. like at the top Bless part, you. at the top part, it's slanted down towards the higher E. Uh, and then at the bottom, it's like slanted the other way. And at some point there's a, uh, like a, uh, like a true neutral, Ver, uh, horizontal fret mm. uh, it's it's like they're making these guitars more efficient and more effective at what they're doing which makes me really interested in them because I feel like besides metal music they have a lot more applications like I feel like if you put a folk song or like an indie song mm-hmm. with a extended range guitar <laughs> it can honestly go pretty hard you don't even have to use it for like rhythm you could use yeah. it as like a another bass timbre yeah right without also like doubling down on like a bass guitar because you can have both of them playing because they're two different timbres mm-hmm. even though they're going to be playing similar notes and such it's like why you can use a synth gu- or a, it's why you can use a synthesizer with a guitar as well interesting or like a piano so where's your nine string it's not here yet oh, okay. i bought it like yesterday oh okay so you're just fucking hyped for it now. yeah well <laughs> i wanted to talk about it because i got really interested in them recently i was interested i've always been interested in them but looking more i was like only going for an eight string but now i'm like i kind of want to get a nine string <laughs> yeah you can't get two of the same guitars come on i'm probably just gonna sell this one really but oh. it's like i don't need this one now now that i have an extra string yeah. <laughs> 
I can do everything that one can and more. Yeah. Um, but That's like cool. with those extended range guitars with, you know, gent music, the thing that uses those, uh, like you can hear rhythms all over the place with mm. them. But listening to like nine string guitar music, it's like way different even still from other gent music. Yeah. I mean, there's probably a plateau or like a, a point that you'll reach before it starts becoming gimmicky. But I feel like these, like the eight and nine string guitars have a certain um, quality to them that can still be applied to a lot of different yeah. things. And with the advent of multi-scaling, it's going to be a lot more applicable to a lot more things coming in the future. Let's tap into the market first. <laughs> Get on that multi-scaling move, okay? That's why I made the joke over at your house. I was like, you don't need all those keys on that keyboard. <laughs> I honestly don't. I don't use them all. But they, they allow you to have a lot more. That's true. Because like low piano notes, are, they're pods. They're insane. They sound awesome. Yeah, they do. On like a grand piano. Yeah, they're like balls. <laughs> <laughs> like they're, they're real as shit. <laughs> how is, uh, how, what's your guys' like YouTube homepage looking like? <laughs> like I'm, I'm genuinely curious. It's all ASMR. All ASMR. That's really like recommended. I don't even, like I, I watch videos of asmr like when i go to sleep but mm -hmm. like not it's like rarely during the day but I it's just, like all i get because it's so saturated on youtube mm -hmm. that's fair i looked up i oh my god i looked up gurn Lagan uh like a week ago and my <laughs> my entire feed has just been flooded with just like the fucking theme songs all the transformation <laughs> themes all the fights it's like okay <laughs> yeah, you watch one thing once and then it's <laughs> yeah forever and at always. least it's not family guy anymore i think, <laughs> think gurren lagan took over family guy in my feed actually that's good well, gurren lagan won the war why are you being recommended family guy because he I, watches highlights all the time yeah i watch true. highlights once in a while, I see. Alex, you have your phone out right now. I know you're going to watch it during the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> He's been watching them. I saw him. He's, yeah. It's just plain. It, <laughs> he just plays it passively. Like, <laughs> just to, it's like his comfort. It helps me sleep. But yeah. It helps you me study. The, the reason I bring that up is because the YouTube homepage is the most, like, ridiculous shit. Like, you'll see, like, haha, family guy, funny moments. Uh, watch, uh, watch me prank this entire homeless family. And it's like, okay. <laughs> and then the Uvalde shooter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was scrolling through, like, a couple days ago, and I literally see, we cured cancer? Question mark. It's like, what the fuck? Did we cure cancer? It's real. No way. It, we, it's probably, like, a specific type of yeah, cancer it's, or it's something. It's most definitely a specific type of cancer. I didn't bother clicking on <laughs> so then how are you saying it's real <laughs> read literally reading a headline you didn't even read a headline of an article you read the title of a youtube video <laughs> and I, YouTube. I watched the first minute of it and then i got bored the youtube <laughs> thumbnail has like someone sewing like with the yeah. fucking finger oh, a big cancer. red, big red circle it. yeah Pointing to like a infected cancer cell. Hold I up. did see a I'm Reddit. Google it. I saw a Reddit post of a guy who said that he made a a a pill or something. Or no, he made some kind of a uh, cure for some kind of brain cancer. Yeah, because his like daughter like died or something. I think it was his dad okay. or something. I thought it was that. I could be wrong, but so I think that type of cancer might be cured. Whatever type, whatever specific type that is. There are a lot of cancers that we know of to, or like we've worked with a lot recently that yeah. we have cures for. Well, quote unquote cures, but like very yeah, like good. testicular cancer cures, <laughs> lopping it off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Same thing with like uh, ovarian cancer. Skin it just cancer. scoop you out. Yeah, well, it sucks. That's not like the best option no. for it, but it works. Yeah. But like, well, I think it's, it's usually what they do, I think. Because it's like, I don't know. Would you rather I'm sure they do it? But yeah. it's it's not like the best. Pre I'm, uh, there's like a there's the thing is like with medicine like that, there's a way that we can do it better. Mm. Like, because if we have that problem, it's like, why stop there? Just because we have a solution doesn't mean that it, it is the best. Solution. Oh, no, that's true. Do I'm you guys saying, think like, big yeah. medicine is holding out on us. Absolutely. I mean, at least in some regard, I, there's conspiracy that, that Dude, they've already like found the cure for all cancer. And I don't know. I don't know if I'd go that far. I, mean, I wouldn't go that found, far at all, though. If they found the fucking cure for cancer, they would pump that shit out immediately and make trillions of dollars. Why the fuck would they hide yeah, it? Like, yeah, sure. I don't know. That, that doesn't really make sense to me in a capitalist society or whatever. I believe, it's not like it's going to stop the creation of cancer. No, you just cure it after the fact. Other people are going to have other diseases like diabetes that never goes away. They're going to have fucking... Uh, like Hunt's disease and all the crazy genetic disorders and like all that shit that still needs to be cured. So it's like, you know, I don't think that they're holding out. That's like a weird conspiracy theory. Yeah, it's really just the vaccines, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like they're, they could be holding out on like other different types of illnesses. Maybe not something to that extent, because if they did have the cure to cancer, 
Anthony's right. Like they, they would make so much money off of it rather than just keeping it locked away. Yeah. So why do you think big medicine's holding out on us? I mean, greed. Oh, fair. Yeah, but what does that mean? <laughs> like, money. But you, you don't think they, they would make ulterior? more money by curing it? Well, it, it's like certain things that have uh, like a pill-based solution. Like what? I mean, a lot of things. I mean, like mental illness is one of them. I'm pretty sure that they're, they're probably, I mean, there may not be a cure for mental illness yeah, and something that is like just a vial of liquid or some shit mm-hmm. like that. But um, mental it. illness isn't a good example, but shit that is like maybe uh, bacterial infections or something. I just, I don't see why they would do that because it's like, it's literally their job to, because like people need the drugs, right? Mm-hmm. If they don't produce the drugs, they're just going to die. If they keep producing the drugs, they make money. Like, I don't, like, bacterial infections don't go away. Like, those are going to keep coming back because they happen from surgery, they happen from colds, they happen from anything. So it's like, there, it really doesn't make sense for them to hold out, like, a, a, a quote-unquote cure for certain bacterial infections. Well, the medicine's cure actually it. run by superbugs who are immune to every virus, or every <laughs> cure. <laughs> Just to preface, I'm not, like, a firm believer in this. He's but a firm I, believer. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Like, he's a conspiracy I'm a conspiratorial theory. person. Believer. <laughs> um... But like if if they were to cure something that is bacterial and it uh, like in it, what we have now is they do come they do come back like the bacterial infections do keep coming mm-hmm. back. But if they had the cure for it, they wouldn't be able to, you know, sell these uh, like the bottle of pills that you need to keep taking. Every oh, but are they time. just antibiotics? Because, yeah. I mean, but, I get what you mean, because in the long run or I guess really it's all short term gain because then it's like you can like every two months I'm going to sell these bottle of pills to suppress these effects when I can cure them kind of thing. It's like when it comes to like marketing schemes now, you see all the time there's like subscription boxes and shit, mm-hmm. which yeah. is like, you know, I'm this is your subscription to life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> good luck. I don't, I don't have like a good example to really yeah. give, which probably means that there isn't a, an example where they really need to do that, yeah. but, which is why I'm not a staunch believer, but I think Sounds it's still fine. something to think about. I, I just think, cause I've, I've heard this sentiment before where it's yeah. like the, it's the, common. the big Big Pharma doesn't want to give you the cure because if they gave you the cure, you wouldn't need their medicine. And it's like, um, maybe like, <laughs> do you think like, they do that with marijuana? Um, well, I don't think the pharma industry really has anything to do with marijuana. You know what I mean? That's like, that's, I think they would because I think that's something that they would try to lobby against. Why would they try to lobby against it? Because there's a lot of other things that marijuana would help with. We don't like pain relievers and shit. And that's all money. Yeah, that's all cash that they can make. So why would they lobby against it? Yeah, maybe. I mean, that's a good point, but I, I feel like they're because it's also <laughs> probably, probably cheaper to produce. Motive. It's probably cheaper to produce weed than it is yeah. to produce. I mean, like, yeah, you just have a whole like field yeah. of it. And that, that's the thing: the ulterior motive. Like, what's the ulterior motive? Like, they want to get everyone addicted to painkillers and destroy the country, and so they're just evil. Like, yeah, yeah, maybe. I, yeah. yeah you believe in evil people? <laughs> <Absolutely>. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, I, I don't believe in evil people. Personally. I'm going to fucking cringe about this on Facebook. You should, because <laughs> you're cringe. That's where you'd get the most staunch support. Yeah, absolutely. It's actually true. But like, you Starting know. a cult. Because it's like that whole big pharma thing, like the conspiracy, it feeds into like anti-vax shit where it's like, you know, if they really wanted to cure COVID, like they wouldn't make this new vaccine or whatever the fuck. Like, I don't know. People are just kind of silly, I think. Mm-hmm. The, people are like, there's a lot of like mass distrust over everything, like yeah. like all the systems in place. And I can understand why people would distrust them, but it's like um, they're distrusting them in places where they shouldn't, you know, because obviously people within those systems and those institutions do really fucked up shit. Like the Purdue family, uh, which is a big pharma um, corporation who like pushed the Oxycontin uh, subscriptions like onto Mm -hmm. like a lot of doctors and stuff. But it's like even that problem's complicated too because at the end of the day, it's the doctor prescribing it. Um, But then like, I don't know. It's just, it's all drugs and pharmaceuticals are really complicated like stuff, especially in our country. Because like, if you think about like the, um, like the whole like addiction thing, like the opiate addiction uh, crisis, it's like, When people get their hands on painkillers and they start to get addicted to it and they go back to their doctor and they try to get more pills and then the doctor like rejects them, um, then that patient is just going to go to another doctor, try to get the pills. If they don't get them, they're going to go to another doctor. You know what I mean? They're Mm going to doctor shop until they get those pills and it just continues the cycle of um, addiction. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? So it's like it's a really like it's a multifaceted problem with big pharma. It's not just big pharma. It's not just the doctors. It's not just the people. It's like everything 
like there's a weird interplay between all three that just kind of fuck everything up. Well, do you believe in like the negative connotation of big pharma? Yeah, I because I used to be like in that crowd, like I like big pharma, big business, big blah, blah, blah. But I feel like a lot of that stuff doesn't really impact us the way that it that we think it does or the way that it's marketed to us very often, because it's like like what we were saying before with big pharma conspiring against people like it really makes no sense for them to hold out on cures because that's free money. It makes no sense for them to lobby against weed because that's free money. You know what I mean? Like if at the end of the day, big pharma is this evil uh, conglomerate of corporations that all they want is money. You know, it's like, why wouldn't they do the things that give them the most money? You yeah. Know? Cause they could definitely yeah. sell cures for. Yeah. And also like the thing about like marijuana legalization, it's like, Marijuana is only very recently popular, right? And it's like, in order to, it's not popular among Republicans. I, it's, or it's not like as unpopular as it used to be among Republicans, but it's still not like a uh, majority popular. Yeah. So it's like, if we don't have a government that is a majority of like the people who support it, like if we had a majority Democratic Senate or whatever, which we don't, we, it's like a 50 50 split and like two of them or three of them are basically Republicans in a lot of ways. Um, it's just, yeah, like the only way that you're going to get those things passed is to elect more people that actually like believe in it. You know what I mean? It's not really like a lobbying. Lobbying doesn't really play much of a role in it, I think. I think there might be an important distinction between like how it's legalized, because I think a lot of like medicinal marijuana is kind of its own separate thing from. And I, um, I think majority of people support medicinal marijuana. Yeah. I, I, people are pretty reasonable nowadays because it's they're seeing the benefits of it. Um, but, but it is a very recent thing, like in the grand scheme of yeah, I mean, know, medicinal marijuana policies yeah. and, and like things like that. You medicinal know? marijuana didn't really come into the public until like maybe twenty years ago. It started popping up, maybe even, even recently. That, like yeah, I feel like it's more so like around the two thousand tens. Use cocaine feel. medicinally before. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Actually, we used cannabis too back in the day, oh, yeah. but it was like. Um, but yeah, it just wasn't seen in the same context as, context as it is today. Mm. Well, we used to give people cocaine and heroin for like... Yeah. Uh, or opium, not heroin, but... Yeah, no, we straight like up we gave, uh, yeah, we straight yeah. up gave them heroin. We let the Chinese borrow a lot of it too. Yeah. yeah. I think we gave them a lot of it. <laughs> well, no, that was, that was England, right? <laughs> oh yeah, I think that oh, was yeah. That was not yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't do it, guys, please. Uh, but do you guys think like the same kind of effect that... Her so heroin, obviously, heroin and cocaine were in a lot of stuff back in mm. the day. And then it was Coke, <laughs> Coke yeah, in Coke. Um, so like since they realized the harmful effects of them and removed those uh, ingredients from like recipes. Yeah, and they sucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the cold medicine sucks ass now. I can't get lit. <laughs> Cola just doesn't taste the same. Do you think things like uh, Advil and like morphine would go the same route in the future? Ooh, no, I don't think so. Or not Advil, not Advil. Yeah, not Advil. Uh, fuck, what's it called? Adderall. Adderall, fucking... Oh. Um, like Vicodin. No. I, like I hope it does. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. If they banned Advil, it's scream. It's not like, I don't know. Adderall's not meth. It's baby meth. Okay. It's a little <laughs> amphetamine. Okay. Everybody needs a little <laughs> amphetamine to get through the day. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, um, you know, like we still use like opi, like we have um, opium derived products still that are still used in. I'm pretty uh, sure morphine and, is opiate yeah. derived. And um, so it's like, it's not that they go away. It's probably just that they're less widely used, you know, which I think is probably a good thing. I think maybe like Adderall might be over prescribed to a lot of people, but it's also really hard to tell. And it's also really hard to make the call like we need to prescribe less of this when it's like, well, now there's there's going to be like edge cases where these kids who actually really need the Adderall are rejected it because of like this whole like, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, because like Adderall. And it's and Adderall is not even the only one. There's Vyvanse and there's Ritalin and there's whatever. Yeah. But like there's um, like that can be massively beneficial for like a, a child who's like going through mm -hmm. middle school or elementary school or whatever. It, they might actually just really need it. You know what I mean? But you don't need the heroin cold medicine. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. Yeah. You don't need the cocaine in your Coca Cola. And morphine is something that's used in a lot of very specific cases. Yeah, exactly. Like no one's prescribing morphine for you to like. Do it at home. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Stub yeah. your toe yeah. and they're like, here's morphine. <laughs> I'm going to fucking... Uh, I think I'm going to tie you <laughs> off right now. <laughs> <laughs> they read, they're like the blood pressure thing that they put on your arm. They're like, all right, now we're going to do this. <laughs> I think the only thing that's certifiable 
for like the whole big pharma aspect is like over prescription of those kinds of pills. Because I could see that. But like, but like I said, it's not, it might not even be necessarily a big pharma problem. I'm sorry for cutting you off, but like small doctor problem. Yeah. It's, it could be a doctor problem where like these doctors, they get more service from patients who come to them. And if they're known as the doctor who gives you the pills, you know, they're going to get a lot of service and they're going to get, especially if they're private practice, you know, but would Um, you consider them a part of big pharma? I don't know. Do you like, I I don't know if I I would because, because it's like, they're more if anything, they're part of big medicine, like big doctor. That's I, big I feel doctor. like. Well, I feel like that's different hey, because me, big when doctor. in my head, big pharma is the conglomerate of corporations that produces pharmaceuticals, whereas like doctors and like hospitals and health insurance, like all of that would fall somewhere else. Their health insurance workers. is not big pharma. Well, aren't they also still like private hospitals? Some of them are, but like even, but that doesn't just because they're private doesn't make them part of big pharma. They're part of some other big medical industry. I considered big pharma as like the entire medical industry, from the private to the public. I feel like that analysis like misses a lot of things, though, because then you're just like, this is all big pharma. And then you can cast like big pharma is bad. Big pharma is this. And then it's like everybody has their own definition of big pharma. You know, who are we attacking? What is like what is even actually happening? Because like in a lot of ways, big pharma helps, you know, like making uh, uh, what's it called? making certain drugs accessible and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And obviously like with prices, that's really bad. But it, but even then that also isn't like necessarily a big pharma problem. It's like a U.S. regulation thing, like with how, and that might have to do with like big pharma lobbies that that could be true, like in that specific instance, but like certain, we have like certain regulations that make it so like um, you can't make generic drugs of a prescription until like 10 years after the patent is made or something like that i think that's Um, dumb it is kind of dumb and um uh and so like it allows like people to have like a stranglehold of their pill but like like, this is the thing like it's so complicated because it's like the reason why they do that is because like pharmaceuticals don't actually have like a really high um profit margin like you see like a lot of big profits or, or they they it's mostly revenues. They have a lot of big revenues um, or even big profits, but the profit margin is not that much because of how much goes into research and development and production and all of those things. So it's like, there's a reason why the regulations are there and it comes with a double-edged sword, but it's like, you know, it's, it, it is kind of unfair, you know, a little bit when you think about it. Like if I owned a company and I put a hundred billion dollars into making this like life-saving cancer drug and I'm selling it at this price point that allows me to get like a billion in profits after spending a hundred billion in R and D, you know, it's like, I'd like to be able to have that to sell versus like someone getting it generically. You know, I, I can understand that like desire because it's, it does suck that it's privately ran, but it is privately ran. So it's like, they need to be reimburse somehow you know so with the with the over prescribing of pills and such that seems like the distinction is more with the or like the discrepancy with it is more with the the like what it falls into what we even classify it as rather than like Wait, the actual issue at hand because or like, like yeah what do you mean by that well like we we agree that that isn't like an issue where they give people yeah, way too much sure. um because that's how they start getting addicted to these things it's like once you start taking it a certain amount of time because they warn you of the uh, addictive nature mm-hmm. of a lot of these different pills and prescriptions, but they don't prevent you from doing that. It's like, there's no cutoff to say like, you should not take this many, but they give you this many. It's like a weird. Yeah. Well, so it's, maybe, it's it hard to, be, it's hard to determine that. Right. Because it's like some people experience more pain than others. Right. And some people need those pills, you know, and some people can go through an entire Vicodin prescription and not be addicted. You know what I mean? It's like a lot of it. Cause like that sort of thing, I'm not going to say it falls on the individual because obviously there's like a systemic problem as to why so many people are addicted to drugs. But it's like, you know, it doesn't only exist in um, like in legal drugs. Right. Like there's a lot of meth addicts. Like there's just a lot of drug addicts in general (laughs) in America and everywhere for a lot of different kinds of things. And and so it's like the I guess the problem is, is that we have access to these really good painkillers. And so drug addicts are going to use that as like an avenue to get what they want. You know what I mean? If anything, what we need to do is create like, 
um, like a drug decriminalization program or like uh, create um, what's it called? Like safe injection shite sites and like safe like shite, shite. safe like um, like drug taking sites, you know, where like if they are going to pop these pills, you know, they might as well do it in a safe environment. And then if it's decriminalized, we could like confiscate the pills and mm-hmm. put them in rehab or something like that. You know, like I feel like there are better ways to approach that than like necessarily attacking like doctors or big pharma quote unquote. I'm not trying to attack doctors. No, I, I just know. think there should be some sort of limit because I think even with the edge cases that you do need all those pills, it wouldn't be that hard to like just get another prescription. Right. Because I think most people, at least in my experience, I don't think you're going to need all that they give you. No, definitely not. I, I, when I got my wisdom teeth out, I got like fucking 20 pills, I think. And I took three of them. Yeah. Maybe. That, I mean, that's what I'm saying is yeah. like, there may be people who use all of those, yeah. but I think with, uh, in terms of the, um, addictive nature of them, getting out of it is something that we also need to work on as a society, yeah. because like you said, it's a, it's a systemic issue where we don't provide the correct help. Yeah. It's just kind of like we you have a problem we and punish drug addicts. Yeah. yeah. And we, it, we try to create like a hard stop for them when it's something that in the nature of addictive drugs, you just can't yeah, do. No, it's really bad. It could kill them. Yeah. Like even alcohol, like uh, alcohol is something that's like, there's a fuck ton of alcoholics in America. Mm-hmm. And like, if they were to be um, like imprisoned for drinking alcohol or whatever, and then they weren't allowed to drink at all, they could die from the withdrawals. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and that shit is way more serious with like, opioids and like meth and Mm -hmm. cocaine and shit you know there's a lot of people i've known throughout my life who have been addicted to a various amount of drugs same so it's like seeing what they go through is just like it's like goddamn we're not doing we're not doing jack shit out here and it's like uh i've seen them all go to prison you know what i mean like i've (laughs) seen them get imprisoned and then they go right back to being addicted and then doing fucked up shit and it's like that doesn't solve anything. That Sometimes you get addicted to drugs yeah. in prison because <clears throat> yeah, it's true. just in the environment. Yeah. It's actually crazy. Like how much like contraband is in prison and the guards don't give a fuck, you know? Oh yeah. But it's also, it's tough because it's like, you know, it's like one guard to fucking 400 prisoners or something like, you know, the ratio is all off. Back to the, the private prisons. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, um, lobbying might play a role in certain private prison things, but even then, like, Cause this is the, this is the thing, right? <laughs> I went through a bit of a radical phase where I was very much like, fuck private prisons, fuck this, fuck that. And I'm not pro private prisons now, but like, I feel like it's, I feel like I was given bad information because from my perspective, I thought that like the majority of prisoners were in private prisons, but it's, that's not even the case. I think it's only like something like 15 or 10% of prisoners are in private prisons. Um, and private prisons are bad, and I don't think that they should exist, but it's not as big of a problem as we think it is. You know, I th- a, a bigger problem is actually how we punish criminals, you know, and our justice Prison system in as general. a whole. Yeah, because it's like we, you know, we don't have different solutions for different criminals. Every solution is prison <laughs> or execution. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like any anything you do, you're just fucked. Um, prison time. Yeah. And there's no, it's not made for rehabilitation. It's no, it's just not. made for yeah. punishment. It's meant for timeout. Yeah, exactly. it, it's a timeout. Yeah, exactly. It's a very harsh timeout. Mm-hmm. Especially with shit back in the, uh, back in the 70s and 60s with like solitary confinement. That was like oh, a huge yeah. thing. Yeah. That was like the hot topic of prisons. We got to have a and solitary it still exists, confinement. Yeah. yeah. People go like insane from that shit. And it's, I, it's torture. Yeah. It's essentially like just modern torture. Yeah. It's with the less work. <laughs> yeah, no work. Just lock him in a box. <laughs> yeah. Put the man in some concrete. And Remove this man's object permanence by <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I just because I don't know. I feel like um, I feel like on Twitter and shit, especially even in Twitter, the, Twitter even in the media, crazy it's crazy to like people focus on the wrong shit. That's all. That's yeah, what I'm the thinking. smallest things are blown to the most astronomical sizes mm-hmm. on social media. It's because it's so easy to find slight faults and then you can just blow them up. <laughs> yeah. Also, people just lie. Yeah. Like it's I, I saw this tweet where it was like um it was a screenshot of an Andrew Yang tweet who said like uh fascists, I want a party where fascists and communists can work together, hashtag move forward party or something. And it was like a screenshot of that tweet and it was presented as true, like as a real tweet that he made. And then in the comments, someone asked, Is this real? And they're like, 
no, but it's it's something that he would say. And it's like, <laughs> what? The why do you have to make fuck? up shit if it's like if there's something that's already bad that he said? Like, Source, it's ridiculous. It yeah, it, it's it's fucking stupid. And like that shit happens all the fucking time. And I've like I've been a victim of it multiple times. And I find that shit annoying. <laughs> I don't I don't want to be caught out being stupid and wrong. I like being right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. But yeah, so I think Twitter is just stupid. Yeah, with with social like media like still. that, it's <laughs> it's nice that we're talking about a lot of these issues. But the most of the time, they're not actually pre- they're not presenting any sort of solution. They're just talking about yeah, the problem, and they're not getting to the yeah, root of the problem. In social sense. media as a whole, the net is too wide. It's so hard to dial in on anything specific because, like, yeah. you can find the very specific problems that you know are true and real. But also, it's amidst a sea of just random bullshit. Yeah, that's true. It's that the correct information is definitely out there. You know, it's just a it's like you said, it's lost in a sea of garbage. Um, But like the uh, what's it called? I was going to say something. Info static. Oh, but like it just like even certain political shit like um, what's it called? Like the Breonna Taylor shooting, which was horrible and really fucked up. Um, People on Twitter were always saying like she was shot in her bed, like she was shot when she was sleeping. And it's just not true. And like, it's just like when you have conversations with people who don't agree with you and you say shit like they shot her when she was sleeping or, you know, like it paints this picture where they just like walked into this silent bedroom, fucking put the gun right up yeah, to Breonna Taylor's head yeah, and then shit. fucking like just blasted her brains out. And that picture painted is fucking ridiculous and horrible. And it's like anyone should be outraged at that, obviously. But it's not the truth. It's not what happened. The truth is really fucked up, though. But like they make some bullshit stories. So it like casts doubt on the actual truth. And so it just fucks everything up. And it makes people angry about the wrong shit. They're focusing on the dumbest things. And it's just I don't know. It's just it. It fucks up the movement. Like you're on the right side, but you're yeah, exactly. it in you're, the wrong way. Exactly. You're on the right side, but you're just wrong (laughs) you're just stupid and that's something that you know it is very frustrating because you can have something that has a legitimate movement something that is a legitimate crisis but they always like end up just focusing on the wrong thing and that's like just both sides Mm -hmm. yeah no and it's also it's like um it's just slowly becoming centrists it's people (laughs) well i i think i am a centrist kind of now to be honest and i think it's would not say you're a centrist i i know I'm, i'm firmly on the left but i'm like i'm more reasonable now i think a reasonable uh, left is. yeah <laughs> um welcome uh, to the new age well, yeah. the Once reasonable you, left the thing is like i'm moving forward <laughs> <laughs> i mean we're we we're staunchly left here but like most of the time it's like you you just can't have a lot of conversations with other left people on the internet because they are very reactionary yeah I mean, yeah the they right, are or, you know right conservatives are also like that too probably yeah. even more so in some cases yeah. but and and like, I don't bitch about right leaning people because I expect them to be like that. You know what I mean? Like, I expect them to be shitty motherfuckers who just lie through their teeth. I don't want that from my side. <laughs> Stop doing that, morons. It's like you're, they're fighting fire with fire, but the the house is still burning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also like the Kyle Rittenhouse thing. And I think I've brought this up before, but like people thought that he killed black people. The all Every person he killed was white. You know, Mm -hmm. and like what he did was stupid and fucked up. But it's like, just get the facts right. Just like talk about the thing instead of like creating all this bullshit. That gives conservatives talking points. Exactly. Like like, they lied about this and they lied about that. And and the problem just doesn't get solved. Exactly. We're like, okay, cool. Because it's there are so much shit that reasonable people, reasonable people can agree with the left on. But leftists present every idea like dog shit (laughs) like honestly and it's annoying i think there are a lot of people that are uh, great discussionists but it's it's definitely not i mean like the general public is going to be like that and that's just the problem with that access of information they're going to see one headline and be no that's true uh, the general public does not have the greatest minds in history no by no means we are it's all fatally human (laughs) <laughs> yeah. No, I know. This is this is a fatal flaw of humanity for sure. Like I'm not I I just, you know, I'm venting because I feel like people on the left, sorry. I've people on the left talk about like how, you know, we got to be compassionate and empathetic and this and that. And then like, you know, like some dude will go to prison for something and they'll be like slit his fucking throat. I don't give a shit. And it's like, uh, guys, guys. <laughs> anything other than this, please. Cause it's like they don't have principles. It's mm-hmm. like they don't care about what they actually believe. They just say this shit because it gets some followers on Twitter. 
Get That's some what it feels elegance, like. some class. <laughs> yeah. Because it's based off of like what we should do versus like what feels right in the moment. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, people just want to do vindictive shit because it feels good. You know, mm-hmm. they like, I don't know. It's just, it's, there's just a lot of dumb. I mean, I get bumps. that emotions get really riled up in something yeah. that is tragic that happens. And uh, I definitely get it. Yeah. But I mean, it's good to bring up solutions to these problems. But, you know, the problem is like the wave of emotions that yeah. come with them. It, oh, yeah. That's, that's it's the thing, good like, to be empathetic, but don't like let it. You have to still think logically. Like, yeah. Can, and I will say, I think conservatives have one critique of like left leaning people that I kind of agree with. And you were talking about this earlier. Oh, where um, <laughs> they only ever want to like tear things down like quote unquote and it's kind of true because like when you talk to like a left-leaning person about like uh society they're gonna tell you like we need to dismantle the patriarchy and white supremacy and this and that and this and that and they're doing a lot of analysis of like the system as a whole but they don't synthesize anything and say like how can we change things and actually rebuild things to make it better you know a lot of it is just like you know fuck the system it's a you know harder, what I mean? it's a harder question to answer too Definitely. which is no which is it makes it difficult for their argument to continue. Yeah, it's it's a it, but that's the thing about being a progressive because tra- traditional people already have a head start. Mm-hmm. People don't want things to change generally. Like yeah. pe- most people in America, um, despite what a lot of left leaning people will say, a lot of people are comfortable and they're like comfortable with being where they are, you know, and like. They don't want to shake up the system and dismantle this and do this and do that. Because they lose you know? their safety. Exactly. They, or, they have no not, safe place. Not to even that they to. lose their safety, but it's the perception that safety could be lost. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's that because that's the thing that matters only in politics is perception. Mm-hmm. And that's why, like, if we're lying, if we're telling these stories, people will perceive our side as liars and storytellers, you know, not yeah. as people who actually have like principled beliefs who want to push society forward and like change things for the better, you know, but like we're out already at a disadvantage because traditionalists like the system. We're the ones that want to change it. We're the ones that have to dismantle part of it and then reconstruct the other part. You know, it, it's just like, but we need to present those ideas in we're ways that are, in ways that are digesting in this house. You know, <laughs> yeah. just like yeah. get, get some shit up to code. No, that's, it's it's a problem that just kind of infects the entirety of the population when it comes to politics yeah, because I, most people aren't politicians most no. people aren't invested in politics so when they have a vocal opinion it's most of the time coming from something that is reactionary yeah. well politicians aren't even invested in politics <laughs> they're invested in what their voters want you yeah. know and the voters are just reactionary individuals you know maybe that's the problem though maybe we need more people that are politicians in the truest sense of the word like actual political scientists yeah i i could agree with that but it's like the problem is is that um have an academically run society well no well that's not even necessarily a problem but it's like um what's it called? Well, look at like it, it's marjorie like, taylor green she's yeah. someone who has like no politics she's just running yeah, off of but she was voted area. for yeah you know what and i mean that's uh, that's yeah. what i'm saying the problem is is like she mm-hmm. doesn't know what the fuck she's doing she's no. just voted into a spot and she's like i'm gonna do what my voters tell me to do which is the most insane shit possible yeah i'm but gonna shoot a sniper rifle for a it's a it's a politician's job to do what their voters want right that's yeah, the thing. Yeah, that's I mean, the problem. I, I agree, like, but I feel that comes down true. to the general public's education at that point, which and that's, I think yeah, that that's is true. the core of the problem. Yeah, yeah no, I, I totally agree. And I agree, like, you know, uh, education needs to be, like, expanded and stuff like that. But, like, at the end of the day, we live in a democracy. You know what I mean? We can't, like, force people to be run by, like, these political science academic you know, brain trusts or whatever, yeah. you know, like at, it sucks, but like people vote, you know, we, we, we have to let the guy who can't read vote. We have to let the guy <laughs> who does this yeah. vote, you know what I mean? And then coming out a really ableist right about that. <laughs> um, not that his vote will be bad or good, just that he's allowed. Okay. <laughs> um, but like, you know, it's just, that's like, that's a fundamental flaw of democracy. You know, there's fundamental flaws of humans and they exist in democracy too. And the only thing we, we can, made it. Yeah. And the only thing we can do is talk about it on a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is now over. Yeah, Goodbye. Bitch. Goodbye. I love you. Fuck society. Fuck the system. Throw to Mandarin Orange. <laughs>